Lecture 24, Marx and the Hermeneutics of Suspicion. In our last lecture, we followed the history of Geist through all of world history, culminating in Hegel's own philosophy, where Geist comes to self-knowledge through Hegel's philosophizing. In one interpretation of Hegel, Hegel's philosophy itself constitutes absolute knowledge. Um, that may, may not be what Hegel actually had in mind, and in any case, it certainly isn't what happened. It's not as if history came to an end after Hegel finished writing his philosophy. Uh, there was much else that happened. Religion was still on the scene, for instance. Religion, which for Hegel had been subsumed in this conceptual uh, begriff of philosophy, uh, religion in its unsubsumed, unconceptualized form still remained on the scene in the form of churches and synagogues and so on. And there was indeed a lot of history going on in the 19th century after Hegel. And one of the key issues for Hegelian philosophers after Hegel was precisely what to make of religion and its social and political function. Imagine you're in 19th century Germany. The churches are very important. They're state-supported. They tend to have uh, rather old-fashioned, sometimes repressive and authoritarian ideas about political and social life. Most Hegelian philosophers were liberals. They wanted more secularization. They wanted more freedom from the authoritarian um, uh, the authoritarian strictures of the church. They wanted more free thought. So the issue for a Hegelian philosopher in the generation after he Hegel was what shall we make of religion? Especially what do we make of this philosophical subsumption or Aufhebung of religion proposed by Hegel? We all agree, all of us Hegelians, that philosophy subsumes religion. That is, it, it cancels the, the old picture thinking form of religion and subsumes it to a level of, um, picks it up and raises it to a level of conceptual sophistication. Uh, of philosophical sophistication. But does that mean then that something like Christianity is canceled by philosophy or preserved by philosophy? Remember that the subsumption of an opposition by um, the Hegelian dialectic is ambiguous and deliberately so. It means both canceling and preserving. So what is it that's canceled about the Christian religion? What is it that's preserved about the Christian religion? Uh, is philosophy fundamentally something that abolishes religion or something that preserves its essential truth? If you think that uh, philosophy is, is aimed at abolishing religion in its current historical form, then you're a left-wing Hegelian. If you think that philosophy preserves what's really essential about religion, then you're a right-wing Hegelian. And it tended to be that the Hegelians did divide in this way, left-wing and right-wing. There's very few that managed to preserve the, the ambiguity of Hegel intact. So the left-wing Hegelians were critics of religion. They thought that philosophy's job was to help abolish religion because religion for the left-wing Hegelians was a form of authoritarian unfreedom from which philosophy and its critical apparatus should free the human spirit. Philosophy has the goal of critique, of freeing humanity from this form of unfreedom called religion. That's the view especially of Ludwig Feuerbach, one of the leading left-wing Hegelians. And he is in turn the starting point of Marx's philosophy. So Feuerbach represents the transition from Hegel to Marx. Hegel pardon me, Feuerbach, is a left-wing Hegelian. He's a critic of religion. He argues that the idea of God is a form of alienation, right? Uh, so as opposed to Hegel, who, who talks about Geist alienating itself in history, Feuerbach is looking from a human perspective and talking about God as an alienation of human consciousness. Feuerbach wants to start with human consciousness, not with uh, a, a, a grand story of this kind of divine geist. He wants to start with human consciousness, real species being, Feuerbach will call it, the species being of us as human beings. And where does God fit into this picture? God fits into the picture as an alienated form of human being, as basically something that we made in our own image and then didn't recognize that it's really just an image of us. So Feuerbach proposes what has been called a projection theory of religion. Religion is basically 
of human beings projecting their own essence up into the sky, into this imaginary being called God, who is supposed to be perfect love, perfect power, perfect righteousness. All of those are human qualities, really, Feuerbach thinks. Right? We take what we hope for, for, for human beings, human justice, and we project it up in the sky and pie on the sky sorts of things and say, well, we don't really have justice on this earth, but up in heaven we'll have justice. And so we're taking something that could be real, human justice, and projecting it in this alien form uh, upon this uh, imaginary being in the sky. And likewise with love and power and all those other divine attributes, which for Feuerbach are really human attributes, uh, which we um, alienate from ourselves and don't realize it. We project it onto God, which is an alien power, which really ought to be ourselves, right? The real object of worship ought to be ourselves. We should revolve around ourselves, not around this imaginary God for Feuerbach. So Feuerbach has this theory of alienation that he uses to critique religion. Now Marx is an inheritor of both Feuerbach and Hegel. Marx wants to take Feuerbach's theory of alienation and apply it to the situation of the worker under capitalism. Right? And that's why he'll come up with the theory of alienated labor. The, alienati- the alienation part of that theory comes from Feuerbach. Marx is a Feuerbachian in his early writings who wants not just to theorize about human alienation, but to do something to change it. Right? Alienation is an evil. We ought to do something to change it. Hence, in one of his early writings, the famous Theses on Feuerbach, Marx concludes, the philosophers so far have only interpreted the world, but the point is to change it. Right? And so eventually Marx will propose a way of changing the world, what he calls revolutionary practice, the practice of communist revolution. Now, in order to understand the shape that alienation takes in the real world, Right? Not the shape of, of alienation and externalization of ideas. You have to look at what Marx will call the material world. Hegel's dialectic, Hegel's dialectic is a dialectic of history that's all about ideas, consciousness. Right? For Marx, the real dialectic of history is not idealist. It's not an, a, a dialectic of consciousness. It's a dialectic of material forces. So Marx is a materialist. He calls his position dialectical materialism. But what drives history, therefore, is not ideas but material forces. Yet these material forces are not just stones and and other material objects in that dull sense. When Marx talks about material forces, he means especially economic forces, social forces, the forces that drive class conflict, right? Uh, Class conflict is what makes the dialectic of history go. The dialectic of history is not a conflict between ideas. It's not like an argument. It's like a real conflict between social classes, between masters and slaves, landowners and peasants in the Middle Ages, factory owners and workers in the 19th century. That's the material or materialist dialectic of history. So Marx's materialism focuses on the realities of human life at the grassroots, at the ground level. The social and economic forces that shape human life are the forces that drive the dialectic of history. Whereas these other forces that Hegel was more interested in, like law, politics, culture, philosophy, and religion, those are the superstructure built on the basis of the economic life of human beings. Economic production is the base for Marx. The superstructure built on top of it is law, politics, society, culture, philosophy, religion. Um, all that stuff that Hegel is so interested in, all those idea sorts of things. Uh, ideas are the superstructure. Economic life, where human beings actually make a living for themselves, that's the basis. That's the material basis of human life. So classes for Marx are defined not by their income, but by their relation to the means of production. If you're in the peasant class, that's because you work the land, but you don't own it. right? If you're a lord in the Middle Ages, that's because you own the land, It's your land, and the peasant has to pay rent. That is, the peasant works the land and has to give most of the produce, or much of the produce, to the lord. So what defines your class status, lord or peasant, is your relation to the means of production. And the means of production in the Middle Ages is land. right? So ownership defines your class status, not income. right? Of course, the lord is richer than the peasant, but what makes him richer is the relation to the means of production, the fact that the 
the lord is the legal owner of the land and the peasant has to uh, give away much of what he produces in order to have a right to use the land. So notice, notice the situation. The peasant is the person who actually produces the food. The peasant is the person who actually produces the wealth in the Middle Ages. And yet, who gets the wealth? The lord. Right? That's the story of history. That's the fundamental class conflict which drives history. It appears in various forms. Um, in capitalist society, of course, it's not peasants and lords, it's workers and factory owners. But it's the same basic uh, story of alienation and expropriation. Who produces all the wealth in capitalist society? Well, the workers. They're the ones who do the work. They're the ones who produce stuff. But who owns the wealth that is thus produced? The, the factory owner, the capitalist. So think of what happens when you're a worker on an assembly line in capitalist Europe in the 19th century. Right? You're, you're creating things. You're making things. Right? And economically, you're making wealth because your labor power is the source of economic value in Marx's econ uh, economics. And you're creating economic value by making these things, and yet the, the assembly line carries it past you, off to some other worker to, to add some more value to it, and eventually it becomes a product that is owned by the capitalist or the factory owner, and is sold, and you don't get the, the, the fruits of your labor. You get a wage, which is enough to keep you alive so you can keep on doing this. Right? You're paid your actual economic value, and your economic value is how much it costs to, um, to keep you alive. Right? The, your economic value is not the value of the product you make. Most of that value is appropriated by the capitalist. That's called surplus value in Marx. So you're just paid what you're worth, and you're worth just what, what's needed in order to keep your body alive. That's your economic value if you're a worker. So your human creativity, right, the, the, the creative labor power which creates economic value is taken from you, alienated from you. Right? And that's the theory of alienated labor in Marx. That's the negative moment in Marx's dialectic. Right? There's always that negative moment in a Hegelian dialectic. There's the thesis, then the negative antithesis, then the synthesis. Well, the, the antithesis here in the Marxian dialectic is, is the moment of alienated labor, right? when the peasant has to have to give up his produce, or the worker has to give up the product of his labor. Uh, and this is regarded by most people who aren't Marxists, as natural, inevitable, right? That's one of the key features of alienation. It's regarded as a kind of fate, right? Well, it's just the market forces. It's just, you know, that's how it goes. The factory owner owns that stuff, as if that was inevitable, as if, if, that's, as if that was how it had to be, as if that wasn't a human arrangement that could be changed, right? And Marx's point is you could change this human arrangement. You could create a society where labor wasn't alienated. You could create a communist society. And that's, of course, what Marx tries to do by uh, trying to get workers organized for a communist revolution. Now, the communist revolution, if it ever happened, would be the negation of the negation. Right? The negation itself is alienated labor. The negation of the negation is what Marx will call expropriating the expropriators. The capitalist expropriates the workers' labor alienates it from the worker, and then the workers, by organizing against capitalism, expropriate the expropriators by taking back what's really theirs, taking back control over the factories, so that the worker's work is rewarded and the worker controls the results of their own labor. That's the ultimate goal of the communist revolution. So the synthesis, that third moment in the dialectic, is when the alienated worker reclaims his own humanity, by reclaiming the product of his human labor. So that's how Marx takes the theory of alienation in Feuerbach and applies it to social realities. Now, he got to that point by starting from Feuerbach's starting point, which was the critique of religion. And I want to see how that works. In alienated labor, for Marx, a worker's humanity... His, created, his creative labor power faces him as an alien power, a commodity that he no longer owns, right? All that stuff which is for, for sale in the stores was made by workers, but workers can't afford to buy them, right? It's a product owned and sold by the capitalist. It no longer belongs to the worker. It's wealth, and wealth now is, is something that the worker doesn't have. He has all this creative labor power. He's the source of economic value, and yet he is impoverished. So Marx sees this as analogous to Feuerbach's analysis of 
religion as alienated forms of the human essence. The workers' loss of humanity in wage slavery is attributed to these um, unchangeable abstract forces, just like our sufferings in this world are, tr are attributed to fate or to the anger of the gods or to the providence of God and all those imaginary alienated um, forms of human activity. Uh, Marx will thus compare the, the life of a commodity in capitalism to a kind of fetishism. He'll talk about commodity fetishism because economic value in capitalism takes on a life of its own. Money takes on a life of its own. It has more power than the worker does. Right? The worker, according to Marx's theory of economics, is the source of economic value, but he's impoverished. Money, commodities, all that stuff, that, uh, the financial world that the capitalist has control of, has far more power than the worker, even though the worker is the source of economic value. Right? So, so alienated human creativity uh, becomes an alien power, like a god, like a fetish, which... Uh, controls the life of the worker. And the, the worker has to work because if he doesn't get some of that money back by working himself to the bone, he's going to starve to death. He's the source of all value and yet he's impoverished. And he has to, he, he's a slave to this need for these alien forces like money and commodities which he no longer owns. Okay, so religion provides the model for Marx's theory of alienation, right? Both Commodities in capitalism and God in the classical religions are alien forms of what is really humanity, if we could only recognize it. So Marx thinks that the very first critique that philosophy has to engage in is critique of religion. Critique of religion is the basis of all social critique for Marx. Now, why is he interested in critiquing religion? Right? Why not just focus on um, the, alienate, the alienation of the worker? Well. Marx thinks that religion plays a crucial role in the alienation of the worker. That's why he calls it the opium of the people, that famous phrase. Religion, Marx says, is the imaginary realization of the human being. It's a consolation for what the worker has lost. This imaginary realization is needed because the human being, the worker, possesses no true reality. So he has to have an imagined reality. Um, a consolation like going to heaven, where his humanity is fulfilled in this, his humanity is fulfilled or realized in this imaginary way. His humanity has been taken for him. Religion is a hope for a restoration of his humanity. So religion is, for Marx, both an expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. It's the sigh of the oppressed creature, says Marx, the heart in a heartless world, the soul in soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people like the laudanum based on opium, which workers took to make their lives bearable in 19th century factory conditions. So both critique of religion and critique of capitalism aim at a revolution which will undo human alienation. Another way that Marx will put this, another famous metaphor, is he says the critique of religion will pluck the imaginary flower from the chain. Right, the flower in the chain. Religion is a flower on the chain because the worker is chained up by these uh, forces of economic production, um, and religion is, is an imaginary consolation. And the critique of religion by philosophers like Marx is meant to pluck that imaginary flower so that the worker can see the chains and cast off the chains and pluck the living flower. And the living flower is his own humanity. What ends up happening is that once the critique of religion does its work and human alienation is undone, man will come to revolve around himself as his own true son, says Marx. For religion is only the illusory son about which man revolves so long as he does not revolve about himself. Right? So the project of Marx's philosophy is to overcome this human alienation so that human beings can once again possess themselves, own themselves, be in control of their own humanity and revolve around themselves rather than around this imaginary thing called God or commodities or money. Now, this leads us to what we can call the hermeneutics of suspicion. The hermeneutics of suspicion is a modern phrase, or rather I should say a recent phrase, a phrase favored by recent postmodernist philosophers but it applies to what Marx is doing. Hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. So any hermeneutics is a, is a 
a theory or a method of interpretation. The hermeneutics of suspicion is a method of interpreting cultural phenomena, such as religion, that looks for a hidden meaning that is not accessible or available to the people who actually believe in that cultural phenomenon. Uh, so you can see how this works with Marx. Marx interprets religion, and therefore he's, he's, a, he's engaged in a hermeneutics of religion. He interprets religion in such a way as to say that its meaning is something that the worker, him or herself, doesn't really recognize. Right? The, the worker uses religion as an imaginary consolation. The worker doesn't realize that's what he's doing. Right? The worker sincerely believes in religion. Right? There's all these, these pious workers who think that they'll be re rewarded for their sufferings in heaven or something like that. Marx says, well, this is the real meaning of this is, is that they're trying to console themselves with this, this imaginary flower on the chain. So you see, the real meaning of religion is hidden from the worker. The real meaning of religion is hidden from the people who actually believe in religion. Right? That's what the hermeneutics of suspicion does. It's suspicious of the overt conscious meaning of religion and looks for a hidden meaning. The real meaning of religion can be found only if you know about the social economic uh, forces of production and uh, relations of production that determine the real life of a worker. So that's how hermeneutics of suspicion works. You interpret religion not in terms of the meaning that's assigned to it by the people who actually believe in it, but in terms of a hidden meaning that's inaccessible to most people who actually believe the religion. You see how, this, how different this is from Schleiermacher, right? You're not going to find the meaning of religion in your God consciousness, for heaven's sakes. You find the meaning of religion in social and economic forces that shape the lives of workers. Okay. This approach to religion has really shaped a great deal of theorizing about religion ever since Marx, and in a great number of different contexts. We can, for instance, look at um, hermeneutics of suspicion that is psychological rather than sociological, as Marx's is. Freud's critique of religion, the critique of religion by Sigmund Freud, the great psychoanalyst, is also a hermeneutics, a hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, Freud and Marx and Nietzsche are called the, the masters of suspicion by uh, admiring postmodern philosophers. Freud looks at the meaning of religion in a way that ties it to unconscious forces in such a way that the believer is driven by these unconscious forces. The meaning of the believer's religion can be found only in the unconscious, which is part of your psyche, which is unaccessible to the believer except through psychoanalysis. So, um, well, to give you a little more detail about this, for Freud, religion is like a neurosis, right? We all know about neurosis. Obsessive compulsiveness is a neurosis. Phobia is a neurosis. Hysteria is a neurosis. And for Freud, all neuroses are disguised expressions of repressed intellectual, I'm sorry, repressed instinctual drives, drives towards sex and violence. You're a child, you have say you, you're a, a boy child, you want to sleep with your mother, but you're afraid of your father, so you get angry at your father, right? You'd like to kill your father, this is the Oedipus complex. But you can't deal with these drives, you, you, you can't acknowledge them to yourself, so you repress them, right? You put them down in the unconscious, Freud calls it. But the, the unconscious desires are still there, right? They're not consciously felt, but they're still there, and they express themselves in disguised way, in, in a disguised way. And neurosis is a disguised expression of unconscious desires. Um, in fact, there's a lot of ways of expressing unconscious desires. Some of it is through literature. That's why we have the story of Oedipus, where the desire to kill your father and sleep with your mother is acted out in a play. But of course, the desire is disguised by the fact that in the play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, uh, Oedipus is horrified when he finds out that it's his father he's killed and it's his mother he's married. He's horrified. But nonetheless, he gets to um, live out what for Freud is, is an unconscious wish of every little boy, or actually every adult. The boy experiences the wish consciously. The adult has repressed it and expresses it in this disguised fashion, in this um, appreciation of this play where he gets to live out the fantasy and then be horrified by living it out. That's the, the disguise, the compromise formation, Freud will call it, right? The, the, it, repressed desire gets to express itself in this compromised fashion. Well, repressed desires also express themselves in compromised fashion in religion, uh, which Freud compares to neurosis, which is another way of expressing um, 
repressed desires. Freud compares religion to a universal obsessional neurosis. Right? Um, he's especially thinking of all the rituals that people do. Obsessional people or obsessive compulsives are people who have all sorts of rituals. Right, the kind of person who has to wash their hands four times before going to bed, the kind of person who has a, a definite routine, they can't get up in the morning without doing exactly the same thing every morning, that's ritualistic. Right? Well, if you think of uh, ritualistic life as, as based in institutions like churches and synagogues, then it looks like an obsessional neurosis. These people have to repeat these same patterns over and over and over again. Don't they get tired of it? Why are they so interested in these repeated patterns, these rituals? It must be that they're expressing some deep, hidden anxiety, an anxiety hidden even from themselves, um, an anxiety that might be expressed by a story about, say, uh, a man being crucified by his father, right? If you're feeling guilty about your anger towards your father, right? The story of, of a man being crucified at the hands of his father might uh, be a disguised expression of your anxiety. And then the rituals built around it are ways of giving disguised expression to that anxiety. Now, Freud thinks that um, this neurosis called religion is not exactly the same as an individual neurosis. It's a universal obsessional neurosis of humanity. And sometimes um, individual believers can be safeguarded to a high degree against the risk of certain neurotic illnesses because, Freud thinks, their, <clears throat> their acceptance of the universal neurosis spares them the task of constructing a personal neurosis of their own. Um, he might be thinking of the kind of pious windbag that we met way back uh, in the first lecture with Euthyphro. Ima imagine the kind of annoying, self-righteous, pious person who is very self-satisfied with themselves, very complacent. They're happy. They think they're happy. They have no real self-knowledge, right? They're infuriating and all that. But um, their lives are relatively healthy, at least by their own standards. They're relatively happy. In fact, they're annoyingly happy, right? They're not bothered by all the kinds of guilt and introspection that you and I are bothered by because we're so much more sensitive than those pious windbags. You know how that goes, right? Um, those kinds of people are sort of uh, enjoying this universal neurosis and therefore they don't suffer from the more personal neurosis of you and I who have our, our own private obsessions. Something like that, Freud is thinking, I think. Um, so the point is that for Freud, as for Marx, if you want to know the true meaning of religion, you have to look at something that's hidden from the individual believer, right? And that's a key move in a lot of postmodern philosophy. It's also a key move in subsequent interpretations of religion for the past 150 years or so. Uh, the hermeneutics of suspicion tends to be exercised especially by sociologists and psychologists rather than by philosophers. Philosophers tend to you know, attack religion head on. If they don't like it, they'll say, this isn't true. Whereas in the hermeneutics of suspicion, you're not talking about the truth or the falsehood of religion. You're talking about its meaning. Right? Um, hermeneutics of suspicion tends to assume that religion is false. Freud and Marx both did. They just assumed that, of course, religion is false. And then they asked about what it really means. Why do people really believe in it if it's obviously so false and silly? Well, it's because they have this universal neurosis if you're Freud, or because it's this flower on the chain if you're Marx. But the key point is that the meaning of religion is determined by factors that uh, the believer in religion is not conscious of. Thus, what the hermeneutics of suspicion does is it rejects the epistemological individualism that we've seen in modern philosophy since Descartes and Locke, right? For Descartes, for Locke, for Schleiermacher, the meaning of our beliefs is determined by our own conscious acceptance of those beliefs. Right? Uh, what we believe and what we're conscious of are really the same thing, right? Whereas for Marx and Freud, what we think we believe is not quite the same thing as what we actually believe. What we're conscious of is not quite the same thing as the real meaning of our consciousness. So um, the individual doesn't determine the meaning of his or her own consciousness for Marx or Freud. And that's uh, a postmodern approach, many philosophers now think. It rejects that turn to the subject of modern philosophy. It rejects the epistemological individualism. So that may actually be a promising approach to uh, philosophy of religion in certain ways. Because after all, if your religion does give aid and comfort to the powerful in society and doesn't actually help free those who are oppressed, then 
you might want to be thinking critically about your religion, right? So the kind of criticism of religion that's inherent in the hermeneutics of suspicion has a real value, I think, for religious people. Um, we do have to worry about the kind of religious believer who seems to be living out a, a social or universal neurosis. Uh, we do have to worry about the kind of unhealthy religion which looks really like a, a form of psychological illness. On the other hand, I'd suggest um, in, on behalf of religion uh, that there are some limitations to the hermeneutics of suspicion. Religion has a whole lot of meanings. Yes, there probably are some hidden uh, meanings to religion. Uh, I mean, Orthodox believers are used to the notion that their religious tradition is richer than they themselves know about, that they're committed to a set of beliefs that goes beyond just what they themselves are master of. Um, but after all, what the individual does think he or she believes ought to count. You, you shouldn't simply ignore what the individual believer thinks he or she believes. That's a little bit too arrogant and in a sense kind of self-righteous. Okay, you, you believe this stuff about religion, but I'll tell you what you really believe. That's what some so sociologists and psychologists are saying. That seems to be a, a little bit arrogant, it seems to me. Um, another limitation of the hermeneutics of suspicion is that the interest that religion serves includes more than just the status quo, right? It doesn't just uh, help us cope with our neuroses for Freud. It doesn't just help us cope with social oppression and, and continue with social oppression in that way. Uh, sometimes it gives people reasons for rebelling. There's such a thing as liberation theology, after all. Sometimes it gives people moral strength to resist. Some people resisted Hitler for religious reasons, right? Um, the opposite side of the coin is many sociologists like religion because it support social stability, right? They like it for the same reason that Marx doesn't like it, right? Uh, Durkheim thinks that religion supports our social life in a way that's good for us, not in a way that's oppressive. Likewise, um, there's a similar variety in psychological interpretations of religion. There's a lot of psychologists who think that religion functions in a way that's good for our psychic life. Uh, for every Freud, there's a Jung, Carl Jung, J-U-N-G, who thinks that religion plays a symbolic function in our psychic life that's absolutely indispensable. Religions for Jung are systems of healing for psychological illnesses. They're not neuroses. They're systems of healing for neuroses. So for every Freud, there's a Jung. For every Marx, there's a Durkheim, right? For every sociologist who thinks that religion is, a, is an oppressive symbol system, there's a sociologist who thinks that religion is essential for our symbolizing our own social life. And for every so psychologist who thinks that uh, religion is a neurosis, there's a psychologist who thinks that religion is a form of healing. Um, and yet, <laughs> to make it more complicated, even the psychologists who like religion, like Jung, will often interpret religion as if it meant something different than the individual believers think, as if Christianity symbolized something about our, our collective unconscious for, for Jung, something that we need to know about our collective unconscious. But Jung doesn't take the story about crucifixion and resurrection, literally, and most Christian believers do. So even the, the, the sociologists and psychologists who like the symbolic function of religion tend to share with the hermeneutics of suspicion this this tendency to interpret the meaning of religion in ways different than the believers in religion themselves interpret it. You might say, <laughs> with friends like this, does religion really need enemies? And that's something to be aware of in the, the intense uh, back and forth of modern intellectual life about the meaning of religion. Both the friends and the enemies of religion will sometimes interpret religion differently than the believers of religion actually do. And that's why it's very important for the believers in religious traditions to be able to interpret their religion for themselves using the best tools of philosophy and critical thought. And that's something we'll get to uh, in our last lecture.